John Kramer is a sports psychologist who recently retired from Queen's University, having lectured in applied psychology for over 30 years. John has been privileged to work with well over 50 sports to date, from international teams and athletes down to club level. Devoted to sport and exercise psychology, John continues to play a key role within sports psychology in the UK and Ireland. Welcome to this, the first in a series of eight short clips designed to help provide you with the mental equipment to run your marathon or a leg in the marathon. For those of you who aren't familiar with sports psychology, just be aware it can be dangerous territory for the unwary. There's lots of mumbo jumbo kicking about that you should take with a healthy pinch of salt. At heart, sports psychology should be nothing more than making sure that the head and the body work together in harmony and not against each other as you try to maximise whatever your physical potential may be. Sports psychology can't make you run faster than you are physically capable, but maybe it can help you shed some of the mental baggage that accumulates without you knowing it over time. Along the way, you may also find out a little bit more about yourself, who you are and what makes you tick. You'll be able to pick and mix from among the various clips that we have on offer, but maybe it's best to work through each in sequence, just like a successful marathon run, to take a step at a time. Some of the clips will focus on particular aspects of mental preparation, such as imagery, concentration, relaxation. Others will look at how you deal with setbacks, how you can plan a race strategy, and how you can learn to self-motivate through profiling and imagery. Before all that, however, let's start with the most basic question of all. Why is it that you run? If you get this foundation wrong, the rest of the building becomes that much more unstable. People come to marathons and running in general from lots of different directions. There's probably nothing wrong with most of these motives, but some can make you run heavier than others. Let's begin at the beginning and cast your mind back to when you first remember running. Not running scared or running away from someone, but just running freely. Maybe on a beach, on holiday, in a field, down a hill, down the street, wherever it may be, hopefully what should come to mind is that pure feeling of exhilaration, that sense of freedom, and that simple uninhibited movement. And then, sadly, we grow up. Some of you may have found you were good at running, and so were pulled down a competitive route, whether you wanted to go there or not. Others may have been forced to run at school almost as a punishment and because of this that form of exercise was something that was a real turn off to you and maybe because of that you then decided to find your exercise in other ways perhaps only later rediscovering running at a later time in life. These experiences can all leave scars and it's sensible to address them before going any further. If you were to be asked, why do you run, I'll guarantee almost as many answers as runners would emerge. Lots of motives can spring to mind. It could be because you've been sponsored. It could be out of friendship, for health and fitness reasons. It could be because of competition, for teamwork, ambition, whatever else it may be. There are lots and lots of things that can drive us to the starting line. Think of the marathon and you probably wouldn't immediately think of the 16 times world darts champion Phil Taylor but he can provide a very useful learning point when it comes to motivation. Mentally, Phil the Power Taylor is legendary, as tough as old boots, and at the age of 52 he's still throwing darts as well as he ever did. But even he would admit he got it wrong at times in his career. In particular, there was a time when he let other things get in the way, other motives, and in particular, money. His manager at the time, Barry Hearn, gave him a very simple piece of advice. Think poor. Go to the bank on a Monday morning, lodge the cheque and get on with doing what you just love doing, playing darts. And Phil never forgot that message. There's now a huge literature on why people take part in sport and exercise. And certainly lots of motives can enter the mix, but some can provide a healthier foundation than others. You may have gathered sponsorship, you might be running for a good cause, maybe as part of a team. All these motives are fine and noble, but don't let them burden you. Keep them there, but bottle them. 
and make sure an intrinsic love or passion for running is never lost. To help understand what this means, I'm just going to ask you two simple questions. First of all, why do you run? And secondly, who do you run for? The answer to both these questions should be both immediate and spontaneous to ensure that you run freely. First and foremost, the answer to the first question, you have to simply enjoy running. When it becomes a job of work, then you'll run heavy. Secondly, who do you run for? In the nicest possible way, you have to admit to being selfish. You run for yourself. Running for someone or something else can mean you shoulder a burden of expectation that can be hard to bear. Other people may be important to you, but not too important. Otherwise, your desire to succeed can become lost under the weight of fear of failure that comes from being afraid of letting other people down. Instead, think about the goal of your mental approach as to running, as with your physical approach, running light. And to achieve this state, keep these simple messages in mind for now. Run for yourself and enjoy what you're doing. This is probably enough for now. In later sessions, we'll start to equip you with the mental skills to arrive at your destination, and more importantly, to enjoy the journey along the way. There may be times when it hurts, when it feels a long road to travel, but with the right equipment, mental, physical and technical, you can travel that journey with a true spring in your step.